Several years ago, I was sent to, it was a day conference in New York City, and I got to meet theologian James Cohn, who wrote, he has since passed, and he wrote this book that I read in one of the past newsletters, Grace Upon Grace, that it was recommended to you. Let me highly recommend that book to you. It's called The Cross and the Lynch and the lynching tree, the cross and the lynching tree. And he likens how the Romans used the cross as how lynching has been used, was used in this country. It's the powerful saying to anyone who would challenge the powers that be, this is what happens to you if you try to change things. Crosses would line the road into Rome so that people coming into Rome would see this is what Rome does to people who go up against the empire. So, I, the, the book is incredibly powerful and it goes through the history of lynching in this country and you read about how churches were complicit, pastors were complicit, they would announce lynchings from the pulpit. It will be uh, on church property tomorrow. School will be delayed. Bring your family. People took pictures. They made postcards. It's horrendous. It's horrific. And it's part of our past that we need to redeem. As I was wrestling with all of this, I am blessed and sometimes feel tortured by my need to be creative and and so I would I play with paints I'm never gonna have a gallery opening but I play with paints and I was wrestling with this book and I made something that as I was making it my family said where is that going that is never going to hang in this house. I, it, it's shocking and it's terrific and it's meant to be. I, for folks who can't, can you see it? It's a lynching. And it says Good Friday. The horror that we feel at looking at this is what we're supposed to feel when we look at the cross but we're so anesthetized to it that we've lost the horror of it. I made something, you know, I, I made something, like I can never hang this in my house, right? I made something to go along with it, right? A pretty gold frame, cursive. This we can hang in my house because it doesn't shock us the way it, the other does, but it's the same thing. Where do you stand when you think of Jesus on the cross? Where are you? I'm often standing in my mind with Mary, crying, recognizing that, that my sins put Jesus on the cross. James Cone points out that for people who have suffered unjustly, they see on the cross, for people who lived in threat of lynching, they see on the cross someone who understands, absolutely. And Cone's call to us is to live in the world so that we stop erecting crosses for people and that we tear them down. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's called the cry of dereliction from Christ. There's different understandings one understanding, we read Psalm 22, is that the, the Jews who heard him say that would then in their minds 
sing the rest of the song. Like if I were to sing the first line of Amazing Grace, you know what the next line is. Or uh, take me out to the ball game, you know the next line. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know the next line. So they would finish the rest of the psalm, which, which is a, it's a psalm of faith. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it doesn't end there. It trusts that there will be redemption. So that's one understanding, is that it, that it, it is not a, a true feeling of abandonment, but it is a cry of faith. That's one understanding. Another understanding is that Jesus, fully human as well as fully God, and it's one of the tenets of our faith, and it's a paradox, and we wrestle with it, but if Jesus were fully human, then he knows what it feels like to feel in that moment abandoned by God. And if we are living, there's some point in our lives where we are going to cry out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus fully understands what it means to be human. As always, I think it's both and. It's not one or the other. Because of Jesus, we know that we have a God who understands all of our suffering because he has experienced it firsthand. If you have ever felt abandoned, Jesus knows what that feels like. Deserted. Tortured. Mocked. Lied about. Behind your back. To your face. Suffered unjustly. Whatever it is that you are going through or what you've been through or what you might go through someday, Jesus understands what it is to be fully human. Elie Wiesel in his book, Night, which I read in seminary, my kids both had to read it in school. I, I, again, that's a must read. He was in a, Elie Wiesel was in a concentration camp during the Holocaust. And they would line up the prisoners to watch somebody being hung, somebody being lynched to show them this is what happens if you go against the powers that be. And a young boy was being hung. And he didn't have the body weight to die immediately. And so they watched him suffer. And somebody behind Elie Wiesel said, where, where is God? Where is God now? And Ellie, in his mind, said, there is God. At the time, he meant it that God is dead. Jürgen Moltmann, also a German and a German theologian, interprets it this way. Yeah, God was there because God suffers with us. There is nothing that we experience that if we are suffering, then God is suffering. God is not indifferent. And he says, that's blasphemy to think that God would be indifferent to our suffering. To speak of an absolute God would make God an annihilating nothingness. To speak here of an indifferent God would condemn men to indifference. Maltman, Maltman was constructed conscripted into the German army when he was 17. He only learned of the horrors of the Holocaust when he was in a POW camp. He came to faith in Jesus Christ in that POW camp. He came to faith in a God who suffers with. At Christmas, we remember Emmanuel, God with us. On Good Friday, during Lent, we remember God who suffers with us. I have never seen the, the movie The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson, and for some people, they say that's a must-see. I have images stick with me. I don't want Mel Gibson's version to be the version that I always think of. And I read an article in Christian Century right after the, the movie came out, and he likened it to Braveheart Jesus. 
you remember Braveheart, as if Jesus suffered more than any human being has ever suffered. That's not the point. The point is that Jesus suffered as humanity suffers, that God understands. Not that he suffered more, but that he suffers with, that he suffers as we suffer. On Easter, we remember the God who brings new life out of dust and ashes. None of us go through life without our share of Good Fridays, but we remember that Easter is coming and we are a resurrection people. There is a term for when we faithful feel nothing or may feel abandoned by God. There are dark nights of the soul that no matter what you do, you, you cry out for God, you look for God and nothing. We all go through times like that. And it's, it's awful, you feel abandoned. Mother Teresa, we are told, had a profound experience of the Holy Spirit and then silence for decades. She wondered whether God had abandoned her, but she still lived in faith. I think the gift of memory, that, that peace that passes all understanding is not something that we feel again and again and again. My experiences, and as I've talked with other people, you have it and then you get to remember it. Every soul that, that Mother Teresa touched, she imagined was Jesus, and she wanted to ease their suffering. Again, we all have our cries of dereliction, but our faith compels us to to still live in our faith so that others might not suffer. James Cone, not, not that I, I mean, I'm going to say he convicted me, but it's not like I didn't have this idea before, but man, he, he drove it home. That our work is to ease suffering. Our work is to tear down crosses. Our work is to create the kingdom of God where we are not erecting crosses for one another. Crosses are all the ways that people suffer unjustly. And we are called to be peacemakers. Think of the ministry that you have been part of here as a church, the ways that you have, uh, I hear stories of taking mission trips and longing to do another one. Can we schedule it? Because that was so fulfilling. It's tearing down crosses. That's what we get to do in big and small ways all the time. When we ease suffering, we are tending to Christ. And as our souls are horrified by, this, by the suffering, we are doing something to remind ourselves it was not meant to be this way. If you find yourself on a cross, know that God understands. If you find yourself at the foot of the cross, it is right to recoil, recoil in horror and strive to work for God's kingdom. We are not forsaken. We are never forsaken. We are called to enter into the suffering of the world and proclaim God is with us. God is with you. This day and every day, forevermore, God will not leave you nor forsake you. In faith, we believe, we trust, in Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen.